Well, good morning, Family Church and Pastor Craig. I'm so glad that you can join us, whether you're at a campus today, whether you're in a fellowship group, a life group, at someone's house, just a small group, whether you're by yourself, if you're across the globe, wherever you're watching from today, I'm excited to share good news for you. And it's good news for me, and I love good news. I don't like bad news. But there's something about good news that uh, when we receive good news, oftentimes it changes us. And I can remember, man, I was in my early 20s, and at the time I was living in Hawaii, and my now wife, Jennifer, had moved to Hawaii, was working there, and I remember this kind of special day where we're out on a dinner cruise. It wasn't much of a cruise. It was kind of a piece of junk boat and a pretty awful meal, quite honestly. But there's this moment, and in the background is, is Diamond Head, if you're familiar with Waikiki. And uh, that was the day that I asked her to marry me. And I wasn't sure what the response was going to be. I was pretty sure a a yes was coming, but I waited, and uh, she actually didn't even let me kneel down all the way. I went to my knee, and she's like, yes, yes, yes. I barely got to even ask the question. She didn't even let me utter, will you marry me? She knew where this was going. But that good news, it changed my life in in a profound way. In fact, I came to a realization very quickly into marriage that to be married required a change of life. I could no longer live as if I were single. I had to live as a married person, a person that has a wife, and I need to care for her, not just me. And there was a change that happened, but it was good news, and it required a change. And then life went on, and wouldn't you know, we got to this time when our first child was coming, and I remember that moment when I held my first son, Elijah, for the first time, and and I looked at him, and I thought, this is such good news. He's breathing He's alive, he's here, and immediately there's this overwhelming sense that I'm, I'm a dad. This good news presented to me brought another change. I could no longer live as if I were just a husband. It required that I needed to live like a dad, too. That change required the spending would be different in our family, um, how we spent the evenings was going to change, how much hours of sleep, how many hours of sleep I might get. Everything began to change. But it was good. It was good news, and it led to good change. And then our second son, Ethan, came, and the dynamic doubled, right? The double duo here. And so here's our family. And so Jennifer and I looking at 26 years together and two boys that have grown. And and, uh, all the good news uh, throughout our life so far, as we receive that good news, it often resulted in change. And today, I want to talk about good news. And not just good news. I think oftentimes the gospel gets this little brush over of a simple word. Ah, it's good news. I wish it was a stronger word in our culture. I wish it was like exuberant or magnificent or obnoxiously crazy good news. Because this is news that changed the world, has changed me personally. And as you go through it today, I hope it changes you. But I want to start with a really foundational understanding First of all, if you are already a believer, you're already uh, submitted to Jesus as your Lord, I'm going to ask you not to check out. Because sometimes I think we think, I've been following Jesus, I know the gospel. But the gospel is good news every day. Every day I wake up, it's, it's a reminder of who I was and who God allows me to be because of his sacrifice. And if you're not a believer... I pray that you will pay close attention today. Maybe today is a day when you will hear the news in a way that captures your heart, where God reaches in and and makes you aware of a need. And this starts with truth. And I want to just make very clear that at Family Church, we believe that this is God's word, that from the beginning to the end, from the first page to the last, it's truth. It's about who God is. And this whole book, from Genesis to Revelation, is about the gospel about the good news of what Jesus has done for you and me. So as we get into this today, have an open mind, would you? Would you take the time to really think through what this means for you personally? I want to start with an important beginning, and it starts in Genesis, and I call this the good. And if you've got your sermon notes there, you can get those online. Keep up with these notes, and I encourage you to write down what God might present to you. But there's good news at the beginning. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the challenge starts right there for a lot of you. If you don't believe that yet, that is a challenge for many people that God actually created everything. Don't let that stop you. 
Listen to the rest of the story, but it was good. In fact, in, the, in God's word, it says, he looked at his creation and it was good. And then he created plants and animals and it was good. But we get to this statement that he creates humans. And he says it was very good. See, he was longing for a relationship and he created humans to have intimate relationship with him. In fact, we're told that he creates Adam and then out of Adam, Eve is created and they live in this garden in perfect unity. What would that be like? To walk with God in the morning and the night, to enjoy relationship with your creator. And it says that they were naked and felt no shame. Now, if we were a junior higher, hold on, I know that word naked, you're, t- you're giggling inside, but I want you to take that word deeper. It's not just physical. This is about a spiritual openness. This is about an emotional openness with God. They were so connected that they felt no shame. In fact, they felt perfectly safe in his presence and safe to be around him. Nothing was hidden. They were in perfect unity. They had the same thoughts, the same interactions. Everything was as it was supposed to be. And they felt immense love, I'm sure, together as they were in unity with God. And God said, there's one thing, see, in his mind, I want you to love me. I want you to deeply love me. So there's one thing I'm going to have to do, and there's one rule I want you to follow. This is all yours. It's for you. It's for me. But here's what I need you to know. There's one tree here, and you can't have the fruit off of that. If you love me, we're going to have great unity together. And everything is for you, but there's one rule. You just can't eat from that tree. And if you know the story, the bad. The bad comes in. You see, imagine what this is like. You've got everything is perfect. Wouldn't you love to have a perfect world? As I watch the news today, I long for the perfect world. I long for everything to be right, to people to not be angry, to have immense love and not be scared and all that goes on. And they had that perfectly in place. And there it was, the temptation. Do I follow God or do I taste of this tree? And as we read, we find that if in fact did eat of the fruit and Out of this came this new emotion and a new awareness. First, it says that they felt naked. Before they didn't, now they do. And they felt ashamed. And we see that in the text as they go and and God goes, where are you, Adam? And we find that he's hiding. See, when people hide, usually it's because they're scared. A new emotion had emerged. See, sin brought in a feeling of being scared. No longer am I comfortable to be in, in the presence of God. I'm scared. Second, I imagine they felt alone. What have we done? Like we knew we weren't supposed to, and now this overwhelming sense of them alone. And then finally, and this is a strong emotion I, would, I think many of us struggle with when it comes to looking at who Jesus is and what it means to be forgiven, is I bet they felt unlovable. And I'll hide from you, God, because I'm unlovable. How could you possibly love me now? The ugly part comes though call this the ugly there in that moment was a severed relationship god said you can't do that they chose and out of that the outpouring the fallout is that they lost relationship this intimate perfect unity between god and man and god in his love did several things first There's this scene where it says they covered themselves with fig leaves, and I'm sure they're itchy and very uncomfortable. And God says, I'll cover your nakedness. And so he brings them skin, skin of an animal. So provision was provided, and I'm assuming that was out of the death of an animal, a sacrifice, which sets up the beginning of a story that you're going to see if you read through the Old Testament about what it takes to cover sin through sacrifice ultimately laying the foundation for Jesus who would come and be the ultimate sacrifice. The second thing that happened is he removes them from the garden. No longer can you live in the garden. See, there's another tree in there, the tree of life, and now you've experienced something I didn't want you to experience, and now you're afraid, but there's a third danger here. You're now in a path of death. You see, if you eat of the tree of life but live with a sinful nature, you're in a path of death because this relationship has been severed. You can't be with me now. And so he closes the garden off, puts gates in front of him, puts you know, angels in front of him with swords and says, you can't come in here anymore. 
and what they feel, I'm sure. Imagine that moment. You walk out of the garden. The gates are closed. You're sealed off. And now your relationship, your intimate relationship with your Creator is severed. That's where we're at. That's the ugly. But then there's this news, and I call it the beautiful news, the gospel. See, the beautiful news is that Jesus did come to earth. That's God put himself on earth to do something amazing. You see, when you look at Scripture, you realize that everything that you're reading, if you know the Old Testament, starting in Genesis, working through Malachi, as you read that, you get the picture that there's sacrifice that has to happen, and all of it was showing that God wants relationship with his creation. So Jesus comes into the picture. And so we ask the question, why is that such good news? What's the big deal? Jesus came. What's the big deal? Well, the first big deal is it's good news because he came and he lived a perfect life. Perfect. He showed us what it looks like, not only who God is, but what it looks like to have a relationship with God, to be in perfect unity. Second, it says, it's good news because I can't live a perfect life. This life of mine... Maybe I'm alone in this, but I don't think so. Sin is easy, right? Sin is easy to do. It's easy to turn away from God and do the things of the world. It's easy to get angry. It's easy to covet things. It's easy to to have anger with just rages inside you. But see, because of Jesus, I now, I can see what it looks like to be loved by God. And then why is it good news? Because Jesus makes now a way for me to restore a relationship with God. The whole point is that now with Jesus, I can get that relationship back that was severed at the garden. I can have relationship with him again. Why is that good news? Because now I can be forgiven of my sin. And why is that good news? Because now I can be healed, not just today from sin, but for eternity. And now death that was now destined for me, separated eternally from God in hell, has now been granted as a gift to have relationship with him again because I'm forgiven. But why is that good news? Because now I can have the Spirit of God dwell in me to help me in this life. And why is that good news? Because I can restore a relationship to glorify God so others can see God too someday and have a relationship today with him. And I could keep going why the gospel is good news. It's not just a surface level. It's a good news that requires change. And out of it comes change. Like my marriage, as soon as I received good news, I realized a change had to happen. I've been given forgiveness and relationship with God, and he began to work in me and show me that love is possible, that peace is possible, that joy is possible. The fruit of this life can be profitable for God, can bring him glory, not be for evil. And of all of that, I get to have a restored relationship with my Creator for eternity. That's the good news, that Jesus came. I want to share with you a family. I've invited them to come and and talk with us. Now, the Canes uh, serve in Cambodia with the Krung people, and we've uh, we've brought them here to uh, Roseburg area and as an opportunity for you to meet them. But I want to give you a chance to hear how the gospel has impacted them personally. So welcome, Brian and Lydia Kane. I'm glad you could finally join us here uh, in the Roseburg area. Thanks for coming. Uh, Thank you, Craig. And thank you, Family Church, for all of your love and your care for us. You guys have been part of our lives, whether you know it or not, for many, many years. As you have given and invested towards the Krung people, you've been a benefit and a blessing to our family. And over the past several years, we've really come to love your church and be amazed you've been an incredible example to us of how to interact with missionaries and uh, we're so happy to finally be here and visit with you guys if only through video we're still glad that we could be here thank you craig i would like to add my own thanks to the way that your church has poured out their love by financially providing for many of your leadership to come visit us um That is an incredible uh, comfort, encouragement to a missionary to have people give up days of their time, their vacation, their finances, to spend time in a 
rougher type of setting and just be there to love on the missionaries. And so thank you for your part in sending them. And we would love to be able to meet many of you who have sent gifts along the way with the many trips that they have made over. And hopefully in one of the meet, or greets, meet and greets that we're going to be having, we'll be able to meet with some of you. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's, it is a, actually a great privilege when we get to visit them. Uh, they spoil us. And, and Lydia cooks amazing food. And I go there and I have to come back and go on a six-month diet. Um, so thank you guys as well. You really welcome us into the country when we come. So um, I wanted to transition a little bit and think about, we've just been talking about the gospel. And really personally, let's start a little bit, just a brief intro. You heard the gospel at some point in your life, and then you surrendered to Jesus. And so what was that like for, for each of you personally? Do you want to start, Lydia, and maybe share a little bit? I grew up in a Christian home. I was a missionary kid. I grew up in the Philippines. So needless to say, the gospel was in my life from infancy. And as is the case with many children who have grown up in Christian homes, there was never a specific time that I can remember that I said, this is the day of my salvation. Um, I do remember being baptized and needing to be baptized because I was a follower of Jesus. And throughout my high school years, that never really bothered me that I didn't have a date. I just knew that I was a follower of Christ. And in college was probably the time, my junior year, where um, that was put before me. Um, what day did you become a follower of Jesus? And it actually created a bit of angst in my spirit not knowing the day, and I just struggled, and um, a very, very mature uh, lady that I went and spoke to was able to um, talk me through these answers and ask me, well, where is your hope? Where do, who is your hope in death? Who is your hope in life? Where do you put your faith? And I said, Jesus and the cross and what he has done for me, and I want to be a follower. And um, that, that is my only hope in life and death, is that Jesus Christ died and paid for my sins. And he has become my master. And I can say that he helps me do very difficult things. And Cambodia was one of those difficult things that he was able to help me do, not without struggles, but he, he has given me victory in many areas and um, the desire to be a follower of him because he is such a good, a good savior and a good king. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, it's powerful when you, when you hear, even that's often the, the struggle that I hear with people is when they've grown up in a Christian home. I don't really know the day, but at some level you can even say, well, that's a day. I'll just go with when I was in college. Yeah, good. That's a day I'm, I'm fully in. You know, but the, the heart is still there, and that's what's important, that your heart was to follow him, which is cool. How about you, Brian? What's, how would how this impact you? How did the gospel enter your life? Yeah. Well, I also grew up in a Christian home, and, and as Lydia mentioned, can't really speak to a specific time in which I began to believe because from early on heard the gospel. But my life was inconsistent with my faith and trust in Jesus Christ because my peers, the people that I hung around with, they were the ones who were in charge of my life. Whatever they thought was good, that was what was good for me. But it really came to a crux in my senior year of high school when I realized that the demands of Christ on me uh, meant that my life had to be something different, and it wasn't. And, you know, you in your message, you've talked about Adam and Eve and how they rejected the authority of God over them and chose to be their own lords, their own masters. And at that point, I had to realize that the gospel meant that Christ was my master and that he was over me. And I, I bowed my knee to Christ and whether that was the point of my salvation or, or whatever, it's, it's unclear to me at this point, but that's where I understood the, the demands of the gospel on me. And from that point, uh, Christ took over, and he's my Lord and my master. So in the message, we even talked that 
um, good news brings change, right? It brings a changed life. So, so as a family, um, you know, we've highlighted that you work with the Krung people. Um, that is a, a focus for you in Cambodia. So how, for you personally as a family, how did the gospel change you to a point where you're now serving overseas with people that of, are not of your own uh, origin, of your own language, everything, and yet you find yourself serving them for, for the gospel? How, how did you wind up there? How has the gospel impacted you to that point? Yeah, I would say that uh, a lot of my life has been stumbling and meandering it along and letting God just direct my paths. But really, that 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 point in my my high school career was was the first step to Cambodia. As I submitted to the rulership of Christ into my life, it was just a matter of time as God just moved each point. Do this. Follow this. And the desire of my heart began to, to really want to see Christ magnified in the nations. By the time we got into, I got into college, that was really where I felt like God was leading me, but I had no specific direction. Even after uh, Lydia and I met, she grew up on the mission field. And so this was definitely a major focus of our life, but we didn't know we were going, uh, where we were going. But the gospel was so wonderful and so rich that we knew we had to go and share it someplace where it wasn't known. So uh, it was in uh, graduate school. Uh, I got to take a trip to go visit J.D. and Kim Crowley who were there in Cambodia. And God just really pressed in my heart that this is where I, I want to be. This is where our family want to be. And that wasn't the end of the story, but that was the, the next step. And then several years later, that's exactly where God brought us. And it's because, you know, with Jesus as Lord, with him as the master, then he just directs you and you, you follow in his. Ah, that's cool. They, they mentioned uh, J.D. and Kim Crowley and wonderful people who've been serving in Cambodia since the early 90s. And uh, we've had opportunities to have dinner at their home. And these are just uh, faithful missionaries who continue and uh, they are very welcoming and obviously impactful because they're part of your story too. Yeah, and, and JD also wanted to, me to send his greetings and his thanks. Uh, you as a church also contribute to the pastor's school that's uh, done once a year or twice a year. And uh, we just are so thankful to you for being a part of that. The Kurung obviously are blessed through that. And then all of the churches also are blessed from that as well. Yeah, and just for clarity, we also, um, you know, we use this term adoption, but it's just this this commitment is what we really want to say strongly. We're committed to the, the Krung, and then as well, the Brow. So the Brow are part of, and you interact with with both the, the Krung and the Brow people groups. Um, so oftentimes you'll hear us talk back and forth about that. Uh, don't get confused. They're two unique people groups, but they're also very similar and live... <laughs> in the same areas. So um, the last part in our final time, I just wanted to have you kind of speak to um, the gospel came to you. The gospel has changed you. It's impacted you to a point where you left your culture, went into the Cambodian culture. But how do you see the gospel changing Cambodians? What's, what is that impact life? What are you seeing as you work there with the Krung? Yeah, and when I speak about Cambodians, Primarily, my experience is among the, the Krung and the Brau, uh, and my focus is specifically with, with a lot of the Krung, Krung villages. Uh, God has been doing amazing things among the Krung and the Brau and all of those areas there for many, many years. And because they're an animistic culture, they're driven by fear of the spirits, what the spirits are going to do to them, make them sick, make them have bad crops and these kind of things. The glory of the gospel is a freedom, and many of them testified to the fact that when they understood the gospel, it was freeing. They no longer had this paralyzing fear. Uh, they had a hope. They had, a, they had a benevolent God who was over them instead of these spirits who are constantly trying to exact payments so that they don't inflict harm on them. You actually have a God who's for you and who wants to care for you. And that's an amazing change for them. One, uh, 
one example I can give is of one of my really good friends, Nye, and you might, if you come to one of the meet and greets, you can see some pictures of my, my brother, Chan Nye. And uh, he was the village drunk, and his wife hardly ever saw him as a, as a sober man. He was the, the town comedian as the drunk, and he was, he was worthless. He had nothing going for him in his life. When the gospel came into his life, he transformed him from that kind of man to a man who is now an apologist for the gospel. He's the one who is leading the churches and helping the churches as they make decisions about what they're going to do as, as a whole to strengthen the body of believers. And he has been an amazing backbone for a lot of the Krung and the Brau. They've all leaned on him. He knows the old ways. He used to be in charge of a lot of the sacrifices. Uh, he was the one who would help make the decisions about how they're going to do things. And now when the unbelievers will come in and tell them that they're uh, they're they're not allowed to do this or not allowed to do that. He tr he in turn says to them, well, "What are you talking about? You guys don't even know how to do the old ways. I'll let me tell you how to do the old ways." <laughs> so he's just an amazing guy, and and the love that God has put in his heart for his own people has just been remarkable. And this is just one story among many many people that God is transforming yeah. for the sake of His name. Yeah. So you work with Nye also with some translation as well. So you're a part of that process. And I know that for those that know the Kellers, Chuck and Sally, um, you work with them. There's this, this whole translation for the Kroon, and you're a big part of that as well um, as they're working to see this to completion. So um, these are cool stories that, that we'd love to share more of. Uh, but one of the key things too, um, there's a book referenced in your notes if you, if you pick up those notes or get those online called The 3D Gospel. And for some of us uh, in our culture, we don't really understand a fear-based idea, that the gospel for those who live in fear is that there's a God who's powerful. And for those of us in the United States, most of us live under guilt. That's our law system is about innocence and guilt. And so we see things a little differently. So maybe an understanding, it might be a good read for you to look at the, the 3D gospel and understand that the gospel presented has many different components that meet the needs of all people. So I want to thank you guys for joining us today and uh, really appreciate your time. But I want to um, invite everybody. They've mentioned that there's some meet and greet times available. And so if you are in the Roseburg area, uh, we invite you to come join us. So the first one is going to be today, Sunday, the 27th at 530 uh, until roughly 8. We may be done sooner, but just a, a time frame for you. That'll be in South Umpqua at the main office there. So you can go to the website and you can find directions to that. Uh, Monday night, the 28th, we're going to have the same time frame, 5.30 to 8. Uh, that'll be in Sutherland in the Event Center. And then Tuesday, the 29th, uh, we're going to meet at the Green Campus in the Modular. So 5.30 to 8 at each of those. And you're welcome to come to all or one of those. It'll be a chance to hear more about people like Pastor and I and others that they serve with. So one other thing I want to just share with you before we continue is we're about to start a new series next week called We. And We is about God plus me and my relationships with others. And so this is spiritually healthy relationships. So I hope you can join us next week for these messages um, as we walk through what it means to have a spirit-filled relationship. Also, as we move forward, I want to draw your attention for those of you today. If you've been taking notes or if you can get the devotions that we have, uh, something I wanted to present with you to give you a chance to look at the Bible in terms of the gospel. So the first thing is, as you look through this, there's a study for you to go through. And some of the reading is quite large. I'm not going to say that in the course of Wednesday that you'll read everything from Genesis to Malachi. But I want you to get a picture of what it looks like to see the gospel laid out from cover to cover in the Bible. And there's some specific chapters and verses you'll look at to help perhaps give you a bigger picture of this good news that we hear of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But I want to spend the last, last part of our time together. I'd really like to speak into those of you who perhaps are wrestling today. There's something that we should respond to. Now, some of you will have heard this news today, and you're still wrestling. And I understand. It's tough. It's a, difficult, it's a difficult decision to make because when we hear the good news of Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity, and that opportunity is to accept it. 
And the first thing we do, we say, look, my response would be this. If I, if I choose today that I desire to have relationship with God, the first thing I have to do is to admit. I have to admit that I am a sinner, that I don't live a perfect life, and I can't possibly do that, that my works cannot earn my way into heaven. And so I have to admit that, and that takes humility. The second thing I would say is that then you need to believe. You have to believe Believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he came, he lived a perfect life. He died as a sacrifice for us, and he rose again to prove that he's defeated death and that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can go to the Father but through him. He restored relationship and made it possible for us, and we have to believe it. And the third thing I would say is that you need to commit It means this isn't just a statement I make, I believe in you, Jesus. This is a commitment to a changed life, that you're willing to let Jesus change you and that you desire to be changed so that your life can glorify God, that every time you talk, what you say brings an awareness to people around you that God is real and that he loves us. That everything you do, wherever you go, brings glory to God. That is possible as you commit and allow life transformation to happen. So before we pray, if you're in that position where you're wrestling today or you feel today is a day I I need to surrender to Jesus, I want to encourage you to pray with me, but I want to encourage you to go to our website, familychurch.com. You can look for uh, good news. Look for the tab, good news. And we would love to have you get feedback. If you can't do that, find somebody who's a believer. Find somebody in your community, somebody in your home group, wherever you are, and begin to have that that dialogue. How can I follow Jesus? But I'd like to pray with you today. So would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for a perfect life that you lived through Jesus as you came, dwelt among us. Thank you for a sacrifice that you did to restore relationship for us. And thank you that you open up life of forgiveness if we put our faith and trust in you, God. And pray for those that today are watching who are perhaps wrestling with this decision. May you bring clarity to their minds. May you open their eyes to the truth of who you are, God. And for those who already follow Jesus, God, I pray that you would encourage them to have a better understanding of the gospel today, of the good news, the exceptional news, that you, God, are the one who saves. We love you. In your precious name, amen.